Welcome everyone back to another episode of the Better Bid Calling Podcast. I'm Joshua Houston here today with a special guest, and I mean a special guest. Eddie, you are uh, one of the most loved auctioneers in the industry, and I really mean that. Every time I bring your name up to people, they always talk about how much they they love you and appreciate you and just how humble of a man you are and how much work you put into this industry. Uh, but we're here today with Eddie Abels, who I call lovingly and respectfully the monarch of Mule Day. Um, he is... <laughs> The brains behind the Mule Day Auctioneers Competition, which is coming up, Eddie, coming up here in just a few short weeks. Coming up April the 5th, Friday, April the 5th, 2024, Josh. Okay. And before I forget it, I'll send you the check for those nice words that you said. <laughs> and I appreciate you having me on the podcast today. Thank you. Well, we appreciate you. And um, I'd say that even if I wasn't being paid. <laughs> now, um, Eddie, let's uh, let's get into. We'll talk a lot about Mule Day. We'll talk a little bit about the Rotary Club that you're so involved in. Um, okay. But I want to start just with you. Talk. Tell us about your life now. Like, what's what's life like for Eddie Abels today? Well, uh, as you as you know, Josh, I had a uh, 39 and a half year career with uh, Tennessee Farm Bureau Insurance, and I retired in December of 2015. And uh, since then, uh, I one I was blessed that they never told me to stop my auctioneering, so I was able to continue my auctioneering during those 39 years. But after retiring, uh, I decided to start uh, my own auction company, and I started EA Auctioneers and Auctions in uh, 2016. And uh, we do estate, real estate, farm equipment, uh, just about what anything. Uh, that comes along. So we've been very blessed. Uh, I'm not a big outfit, uh, but we do what we what we want to do. So uh, uh, that's basically where we're at today. Okay. Um, I know that because you're you're in Columbia, right? I'm in or Columbia. You in Spring Hill. Okay, you're in Columbia. I'm in Columbia. Uh, the company that I work for the most. Is uh, your next door neighbor? That's I right. guess in, in the business is James Gary Gary Realty and Auction. They're in Spring Hill, of course. But you know our our paths cross quite a lot. Um, Eddie, your company EA Auctioneers has been voted, I think, multiple times as best auction company in uh, in Murray County. We, you know, we've been uh, yes, Josh. We've been blessed to have received that award uh, two years in a row, and. Uh, uh, we're just blessed to have it, yeah. uh, been voted. Well, what do you think goes into making an auction company great where uh, the community gathers around and votes you to be, as the best? Oh, I think, uh, Josh, it's your relationship uh, uh, with your sellers. Uh, that's by word of mouth. If you do a good job, that's, that's going to go and, and get out into the community. And I think it's a way of... Uh, uh, reacting with your with your uh, bidders or your crowd as you well know working for james uh you'll see the same faces at uh multiple auctions during the year mm -hmm. and and you need to get to know them find out something about them and uh, uh relate to that while you're on the auction block and, and communication and uh, be humble be humble we don't know it all uh, so be patient when you've got some first time, uh, bidders that's never been to an auction before, help them, help them out, uh, through the process. And I think just being humble and, and doing the best job that you can go that little extra, uh, when you're getting things set up, take care of the things and let the seller know that you're doing the very best, uh, you can for them. And, um, the same thing on the bidders. Make them comfortable. If you need a tent, get a tent. Uh, if it's in July and you need uh, fans, uh, rent the fans. They're not that expensive. And uh, we've had people that's come to us after auctions and said, we really appreciate how you set something up, how you display it, 
how you make us feel uh, comfortable at the auction. So uh, yeah. a little bit about yeah. that. Well, I think that's really important. Um, I, you know that I preach for a living. I'm, I'm recording this here at the church office today, and uh, I talk a lot about leadership when I go and travel to all these different associations and talk about leadership and the auctioneer. Uh, I was reading the other day from John 6 when Jesus feeds the 5,000. In John's gospel, it says that he, he made them all sit down in a grassy place. And as a Bible scholar, I'm thinking, I, why do I care whether there was grass there or not? And I, I think that the reason John puts that in his gospel is because he wants the reader to know Jesus wants these people to be comfortable. And wow. he's about to do something great, but he wants them to be comfortable. I think the same is true with being an auctioneer. You need to make your seller comfortable. You have to make your buyers comfortable because if they're not, if they're anxious, if they're doubtful, they're not going to trust you. And sure. trust is the foundation of our business, right? I agree with you 100%. Yeah. So, uh, Eddie, had go, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, and one thing that uh, – we've always done is before every auction there's two things that we do uh we recognize all of our, our veterans that's attending the auction and we have a prayer uh, before we start the auction and we've had people come up to us and tell us that they appreciate those two things so it's just the little things that you do uh but you hit on one thing the honesty be up front if you don't know something tell them you don't know about it and uh, go from there Sure. Well, Eddie, you've been in the business for, as you said, 39 and a half years. Is that right? Well, if you go back, I graduated from high school in May of 1970. I got on a Greyhound bus in July of 1970 and traveled to High Point, North Carolina, uh, to Mendenhall School of Auctioneering and came back. And at that time, there was a two year apprenticeship. I did that, and uh, so if you count it all up, all the way back to 70, that's about 53 years, uh, and then uh, I got my license and everything back in about 1985 and uh, started working with some real estate, uh, uh, local auction companies here in Columbia, and some other things, so uh, I guess legally you can say 39 and a half years. Okay. Well, I count the apprentice years too. Uh, well, you do to that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so were, was your family in the auction business or did you just decide one day, Hey, I want to get after this. This is pretty neat. Well, I guess it goes back. No, uh, none of my family was in the auction business, but it probably goes back to when I was five or six years old uh, going to the stockyards over in uh, Lincoln County and the tobacco houses at that time, we had annual tobacco auctions in November and December of every year. And I guess the first time I heard uh, Jerry Gross, I uh, sort of like the Leroy Van Dyke's song, I got to learn how he's doing that. And I was probably five or six years old. And then had the good fortune of uh, uh, had some skin folks that ran a tobacco house over there and uh they knew I was wanting to do it. So when I was about 15, 16 years old, uh, the uh, tobacco auctioneer would let me sell uh, what was known as the trash at the end of the auction. So I got to do a little bit of tobacco auctioneering when I was 15, 16 years old. So, uh, but it just, it's one of those traits, professions that you just get hooked on. And uh, I love it. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about auction school. Uh, when you went, because, you know, I get uh, the, the opportunity and very fortunate, very thankful for the opportunity to go teach bid calling at Nashville Auction School when uh, Shane and JD need me to come. I'm incredibly thankful for that. It's one of the, the things that I look forward to the most, uh, getting to work with those students who are new and they're nervous. And you know, like I told you before, uh, I just love to teach. And uh, I think that's a great, great way to do that. But in auction school today, I do think that there's a shift. Of course, now we have online auctions that we have to learn and uh, auction laws have changed and you know the use of AI and the internet has really brought a change to a lot of that stuff. So how, how has the auction business changed and how has auction school changed, do you think, from what, what you experienced to what we might experience now? Oh, 
the main one of the main reasons that I I went or chose Mendenhall School of Auctioneering is that uh, I really like the tobacco, and uh, Mendenhall had a uh, champion uh, tobacco auctioneer that taught class there. So that was the the main reason I went to Mendenhall. Uh, I haven't sat on any of the classes of Nashville Auction School. I know uh, we went over advertising. We went over bid calling. Uh, bid calling was a daily, daily practice. And uh, Mendenhall also ran um, auto auction at the school. And they put us up on the block to sell um, automobiles. And uh, it, but it was practice, practice, practice every day. And one of the um, uh, practice that we did in tobacco, uh, he get he would get us in a car and the telephone poles. And you know, tobacco is fast paced. Where you had to sell a telephone pole was a stack of tobacco. You had to sell that stack of tobacco before you got to the next telephone pole. Well, that was pretty easy at uh, 15 miles an hour, but when he sped up to about 45 or 50, uh, you were going pretty fast. So uh, the advertising, uh, they would put you on the block, call you up there and uh, tell you that uh, we want you to sell this, uh, sell that, something just pulled out of the air. So uh, I guess a lot of emphasis was put on bid calling itself. And I don't know if you you're in there with the schools now. I don't know how much emphasis is put on bid calling uh, itself as much as it was back uh, 50 years ago. Well, I can tell you from Nashville Auction School, um, so, so far as I can tell, bid calling is very much still part of it. Um, they do offer – there's so many different – styles of licensure you can get now yeah. that some don't require bid calling. Um, but if you're there live, you start with number drills at the beginning of the day and tongue twisters. And then at the end of the day, every day for 10 days, they bring a different person in to help you with your bid calling. Uh, and that's a three hour time block. So for three hours, we are doing number drills and basic chant um, I, when I go, I use uh, David Whitaker's virtual auction software. I put them up and have them sell items um, and get their chant down that way. So there's a lot of bid calling, but there's also a lot of other stuff, too. Uh, Eddie, who did you uh, apprentice under when you were? Uh, Colonel Leon license? Richardson over in uh, Federal, Tennessee. Uh, Leon was the auctioneer at the Tennessee Livestock Producer Sale Barn over at home and also was a um, uh, had a realty and, and auction company uh, there in Columbia. I mean, in uh, Fedville, and um, uh, he took a took a chance, I guess, on a 17, 18 year old kid. And uh, I, I'll tell you this quick story. I got out back then. You only had four times a year that you could go take a test uh, at the state. Uh, you had a they had a date each quarter. And I finished auction school in August and was able to get in and get my uh, apprentice license and, uh, the, in August. And uh, he loaded me up one Saturday night uh, down in Taft, Tennessee, which is down close to the Alabama line. And uh, uh, Mr. they called him, I never did know his first name, but they called him Sharecropper Parker. And he had a Saturday night auction. We sold on second and fourth Saturday nights of every month. And Leon took me down there. He auctioned for about 15 minutes and then put me up there. And he announced to the crowd that I was going to be their permanent auctioneer from then on. And I guess Leon knew that if I could make it through uh, those Saturday nights, and it was all consignment. And we sold everything from fine china to fighting game roosters. And it was a real education for me on that. So, uh, yeah. but Leon yeah. was, a, he was a good mentor. You know, that's how I feel about James Gary. When, when you get out of auction school, the first thing you want to do is be behind a microphone. And for some reason, everybody who graduates auction school thinks that they're God's gift to auctioneering. And I was that way. Uh, it took a lot of humbling for me. Um, 
But James would get me up at the end to sell the junk, you know, the dollar boxes or two and a half dollar boxes. And I'd get so frustrated that he wouldn't let me sell something where I could actually have a chant and, you know, run with some numbers. Yeah. And he told me in a very kind and, and loving way, you know how James is. He don't get frustrated at nothing. And he said, Joshua, if you can sell a box of junk for $5, you can sell a tractor for 5000 or 500000 And he was right. You know, yeah. you, you, if you start that way, you can build for sure. Uh, Eddie, when you got your license, because I, I remember my dad telling me this. Um, this was true of him when he got his license. That in order to get your license, you had to actually live bid call before the auction commission. Did you have uh, to do that? Yes. I went up to Nashville. I guess it was in August of 1970. Uh, it was a handwritten test for the apprentice and auctioneer's license. I, I sat in there. I took the test. And when I finished the test, I turned it in. And then um, uh, I can't remember the lady's name who was the executive director, but she says, you need to go next door and take a seat out in the hall. And uh, I went out there, sat out there for a little while. And uh, this gentleman called me in and uh, there was two uh, auctioneers. I can't remember who they were. I know one was from West Tennessee, and I believe the other one was from East Tennessee. I sat down in a chair, and uh, they asked me some questions. And then without any warning, they said, uh, would you please get up and put the chair in front of us, uh, in front of you and uh, sell the chair? I got through selling that chair, and they looked over, and they had a a magazine rack or something. And then they said, would you sell that magazine rack to us? So yeah, you, you did a live bidding in front of two auctioneers and that mm -hmm. was 1970. Yeah. My dad had to do the same thing. As I said, I did not, uh, whenever things have changed, even since I went to auction school, you know, now you, I think it, they call it an affiliate license that you have to have for six months. And, and then, yeah. Uh, something like that. It's it's like when I went, you had to be an apprentice for two years. I had yes, I had to do an apprenticeship for two years. But we did not have to sell live in front of the commission. You just took your test, and yeah, then either pass or fail. Being, you talking about being tight? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, you think we ought to bring that back, Eddie? Where we make <laughs> these students get up? It wouldn't hurt. It wouldn't. Yeah, hurt. I don't think either. I don't think so either. <laughs> Let's talk about tobacco auctions for a minute. Um, tobacco is, is a different breed, man. It's a different style. It's a different, uh, a different process. So tell us a little bit about tobacco auctions since you have experience in that. Well, it's the, it is truly different from, uh, all the other type auctions that we do livestock, uh, real estate, uh, farm machinery. Whereas in uh, those auctions, we have a bid and we're asking for a bid. And uh, in tobacco, you have a bid and you cry that bid until the tobacco buyers on the other side of the tobacco raise your bid. And you'll go down through there and they'll either go one, six, say you're at 60, 61, two, three, four, five, and then six, seven, eight, nine. They're raising your bid. So you never ask for a higher bid. If you've got 81, you're calling 81 until they raise it. If you don't raise it, then you sell it to whoever had that bid. So it's fast. Um, uh, you're moving down the line or you used to. Now I think it's Bob out of the barn and uh, out of the field. So it's one of those uh, uh, arts and professions that uh, has gone away. It's gone yeah. away. I, I'd like to see it come back, but I don't think we'll ever see that. And in fact, you know, we had we had the honor of having John Kessler as one of our judges at Mule Day last year. And John uh, was the tobacco uh, world champion auctioneer, I believe, in 85 or 86. And he gave a demonstration at the championship. And uh, if you ever get a chance, you can pull him up on YouTube and see him. Uh, in the contest that he won the championship and a uh, uh, very, very uh, good auctioneer and a very humble person. And we were fortunate enough to have John come down and be one of our judges last year. Yeah, I think a lot of John. Um, there's a video on my YouTube page of him doing that at Mule Day. 
Yep. It's one of my most viewed videos. Um, but he's yeah, if y'all are, if y'all want to check it out, it's it's there. He's um, good. He's good. So with tobacco auctions, you're not asking for a bid. You're only calling out the one that you have. Mm-hmm. And number signals with tobacco auctions are a little bit different too. With because how you hold your hand, the placement of where it is, whether it's up or down, and. Down. Mm-hmm. Yep. So a lot to, goes into that that makes it a, lo- a lot different than the other styles of auctioneering. Uh, but as you said, unfortunately, it's uh, an art that may only be around at county fairs from now well, on. If you look here in Columbia, we had two huge tobacco houses. Yeah. And both of them uh, have been com- torn completely down to the concrete. So uh, uh, Columbia was a big tobacco market, Lincoln County. Uh, we had two tobacco houses over there, and uh, we started the tobacco auctions about uh, second, third week in November and ran them up until uh, Christmas and then had a few sales uh, after the first of the year. So uh, um, it was income. Everybody had a tobacco patch. Sure. Yep. And it was, a, some people say it's a, you know, you just strip it, hang it in the barn, sell it. It's a 12 month job. Yeah. <laughs> so, as, like, as, as I, I as I said at Mule Day, it's a 13 month a year job. Right? <laughs> yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. That's exactly right. All the time. Uh, Eddie, you have uh, taken a, a shift, I, I guess, in the auction business because you're now on the board of TAA. Um, uh, talk about that a little bit. What are, what are y'all doing? What are some things that's going on? And what do you see as the future for TAA? I, I had the, uh, the privilege and honor of serving on the board. And then I uh, just got reelected back to the board. And um, the TAA, I, I would put out there, if uh, if you're not a member of the TAA, uh, you need to strongly consider joining it. Uh, the TAA is for all the professional auctioneers and represents all the professional auctioneers across the state. Uh, we work closely. We've got a lobbyist. We watch what bills are being presented, um, how they affect our industry. Uh, We have a voice in that. We have a great communication with the Tennessee Auctioneers uh, Commission. We were involved when they was changing the laws uh, as far as apprentice auctioneers, the time period, uh, the schooling. Uh, We're there to help the professional auctioneers in the state of Tennessee, all of them. So if you're not a member, I strongly uh, suggest you uh, um, get on their their uh, uh, web page and uh, consider becoming a member of the Tennessee Auctioneers. We have the, contest, uh, the uh, convention in November, and that's when the state uh, championship auctioneer is held. It's a fun time. Uh, we have some great continuing education classes that go along with the convention that you can come to, uh, they're free, and uh, TAA is doing a good job. We've got a good president in Philip Trailer out of Clarksville and a good board of directors, and our goal is to make the professional auctioneer in Tennessee better every day. Yeah, well, I'm clearly biased, but I think TAA has one of the best state associations, and that's not a knock against anybody no. else. It's just TAA is so well done, they take the issue so seriously, the, the members of the board are so proactive. Um, Eddie, is there anything going on in uh, TAA, the legislature, anything like that, that you can talk about, that you would talk about? If not, uh, that's fine. Right now, there's there's not anything uh, going on. I think there's a bill that's uh, before them now that has to deal with the automobile uh, auction uh, process where the right. – the old way was uh, uh, the auctioneer uh, had to have the license and the, the continuing education. And I think they're trying to get it changed to where the dealership or the car auction place gets the, the license and we go mm-hmm. there, which I think is a, it is a, is a good, uh, good move on that part yeah. of it. I know the, the real car auction is a little bit di- different. I sold for IAA in Chattanooga, Athens, Alabama, and Nashville for about two years, and it was salvage vehicles. It wasn't uh, 
uh, uh, new or used vehicles like Mayhem and some of them. And they had a little bit different setup than uh, what the others. And I, I think it's a good move. I think it's Yeah, good. I think so too. And from what I know about that, I think it was really just a miscommunication as to why that law got made in the first place. So uh, anyways, that's good. And I'm glad the TAA board and the auction commission are working together on that to get that uh, cleared up and resolved. So yeah. thank you all for everything that you do there. Um, Eddie, you're you're such an active member in, in all these different organizations that you're in. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Rotary Club, because if it wasn't for the Rotary Club, the Mule Day Auctioneers Contest, I don't think would I don't, first of all, it may not exist in the way that it does now. And second of all, it certainly wouldn't be as successful as it is. Uh, the Rotary Club puts a lot of work into making that contest what it is. Um, so I think you, I know that you've been at least an officer. You may even be an officer now in, in the Rotary Club. Um, talk a little bit about that, what they do, especially for the community of Columbia and why it's important. Uh, yes, uh, I've been a member, oh gosh, Josh, 20-something years now, I guess. I was the president of the Columbia Breakfast Rotary Club back in uh, uh, 2011. Um, when you look at the uh, Rotary motto, service above self, I can um, say 110% that that's what our club is. Uh, no one uh, is there in the forefront wanting to take credit. It's uh, always a team effort on everything that we've done. Uh, we give back uh, to our community. If you go down to the river walk in Columbia, that's just right off the square, you will see an investment that's been made by the Columbia Breakfast Rotary Club of over a hundred thousand dollars. It includes a water park, uh, yeah. uh, physical fitness equipment that we were yeah. a part of and a shelter. Yeah. We have put a uh, shelter and a playground out at Ridley Sports Complex that uh, does softball and soccer. Uh, we've got a project going on now out at Unali, which is part of the Murray County Park System, uh, putting up a shelter at the archery range. So every year uh, we pick a project that we want to do for either in the city or the county and uh, uh and ask for no money from any of those entities. Uh, we build it completely uh, with our money on, on that part of it. So, yes, without the Columbia, they gave um, me the vehicle to bring Mule Day to a reality uh, starting back in uh, – I'd, I'd been wanting to do some type of contest for several years and just never had the vehicle to do it. And uh, 2011, we were sitting at a community board meeting trying to come up with a new fundraiser. Well, I suggested, I said, why don't we have an auctioneer contest? Well, they looked at me like, what in the world are you talking about? Well, I gave them a little bit of uh uh, how it would work, and uh, they voted to do it, and then they voted, said, well, you're the only auctioneer in the club, so you're chairman of it, and we brought it to reality, and uh, the first one was um, in 2012, Justin Oaks was uh, champion, and Jacob Massey was reserve champion, and we had 12 auctioneers from four different states, and I even put it in the entry that if we didn't have five auctioneers, we weren't going to have the contest. But uh, fortunately, we had 12 that showed up, and uh, it has grown now that we, on average, will have somewhere 20 to 25 auctioneers every year. And you well know you were our champion in um, <clears throat> 2022. 20, 22, yes, sir. 22, and followed that up with state championship. We're proud of you. Well, thank you. I, I've, it's one of the most special events to happen in my life, in all seriousness. I, you know, I competed in that contest for, I think, five years. Uh, yeah. I, I can't remember if I won it the fifth year or if I won it the sixth year, but I competed in it for a couple of years and always made the top ten. I think every time except once made the top five, and I was very proud of that. Um, not in an arrogant way, but, you know, some of the guys in there, and, and this, again, not in an arrogant way, but some of the guys in there have gone on to be world champions, state champions for Tennessee and elsewhere. 
and um, some of them have gone on to compete in the IAC and be top three or top ten at least, and um, and I beat them uh, <laughs> at, at some time. So, but now they that I beat oh. them that day. Let's say I beat them that day. They probably mop the floor with me now. But uh, no, Mule Day is it is one of the greatest contests in this world in, in all seriousness. And I think it's that way. Number one, because it's relaxed. I think that when guys show up, they're nervous. Of course, you're always nervous for a contest, but there's just a, a sense of camaraderie there among the contestants that I don't see at other contests. Uh, even the guys that are there to compete, to be out for blood are there as your friend. As your um, friend. I, yeah. I think everybody has a good camaraderie and, just something about how y'all put it together. It is one of the most well-run contests. Nobody's scrounging around trying to figure out who's supposed to be where and what's supposed to be done. It's all very well done. Um, Eddie, well, let's I, go ahead. I'll have to give credit to uh, Eddie Allred and, and Daryl Alshire. Uh, Eddie handles the registration parts of it, and uh, Daryl does his thing, and then uh, we have a couple of members – Eddie Hickman that you know, and Jimmy Duggar, and some more that fall in and get the registration, get all the auctioneers checked in, and it's just a it's a team effort. And uh, when we started the contest, I wanted it to be a contest or a championship for the professional auctioneer to come and showcase their talent. I wanted it to be affordable. I wanted it to have integrity, and I wanted the auctioneers to come back the next year. And, uh, Josh, I think we have achieved all those goals that I had uh, had set for it, and we just want it to be one that you feel pride in winning it, but we want you to have be relaxed and have fun, meet other auctioneers uh, network with them and uh, we've had uh, 12 champions uh, six of them uh, five of them i believe have been from tennessee seven have been from out of state and we've had two world world livestock auctioneer champions jacob massey and chuck bradley and i believe justin oaks and trey morris has won iac championships right so and you I have gone on. You and Whitaker went up to Battle of Bluegrass a couple of years ago and was champion and reserve champion. So when I look at our 12 champions, reserve champions, and just all the auctioneers that come and have competed, it, y'all are very high level. I've had auctioneers tell me that the competition at uh, Mule Day is as tough a competition as any contest that uh, they've entered. Yep. I'll tell you one quick little story. Whitaker, David Whitaker won it in 2015. And I was sitting at home one Saturday afternoon, phone rang, and it was Whitaker. And uh, he said, you've hit the big time. I said, what are you talking about, David? He said, well, I was at the world um, uh, Worldwide Auctioneering School and said I had two or three come up to me and, and say, what in the world is this Mule Day auctioneer contest? And he says, you've hit the big time. I said, well, I'll go about the big time. Uh, we just, uh, we just glad that we've been blessed at where we're at. Yeah. And where well, we're going. I, I really do believe, and I'd say this even if it wasn't to you, I really do believe that Mule Day is one of, if not the premier auction contest at least in the southeast, maybe even this side of the Mississippi River, and at least in the top three in the entire country. Well, you know, they're, 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 doing, they're doing great work with these other open contests like the Mile High and uh, the one in Texas that they just had. The, the, the name of it escapes Lone me right Star. now. Lone Star. That Lone Star, that's right. Yes, sir. Yep. Um, they're doing great things with those. Um, but, you know, the thing about Mule Day that I've always appreciated is even – Going back now as a past champion, once you win, you don't compete anymore, but you still like to go back to watch everybody else. And, of course, I think if you're a champion, you need to support the organization that named you champion. You need to be their biggest cheerleader. 
but even going back now, it feels like home. You know, everybody there is just so friendly. Everybody wants the best for each other. And I, I love that. I really love that about this contest in particular. Well, and that's another thing that uh, uh, the executive and community board voted is that we have made all of our champions uh, from 2012. We've made all of them, all of y'all, honorary members of the Columbia Breakfast Rotary Club, and uh, with the help of our our senator and our representative, we've also made all of our champions uh, colonels. Uh, that's our title as auctioneers, and uh, Joey Hensley and Scott Sapecki has uh, has helped me each year. Uh, the the past champion is made an honorary colonel of the state of Tennessee. So it's just little things. We appreciate you because we couldn't have it without uh, without y'all and you, you all the past champions, all the auctioneers. Uh, really support us. As I go around the state and other places, um, I'm asked about it, and uh, it's because of the support we get from the auctioneers that come, and we appreciate that. Do you know off the top of your head how many are entered up for this year so far? Well, in fact, uh, Eddie Allred uh, gave me the list uh, this morning, and it looks like we're hitting on about close to 30. So, so oh, if that holds true, uh, 2019 was our largest where we had 28 auctioneers. Uh, but the list he gave me this morning was about 30. So we're getting close to saying uh, that's about all we can handle. And mm -hmm. the, the one thing I'm most excited about this year is we're going to have a junior championship. I'm excited uh, about that, too. Uh, yeah, yeah. Awesome. And, and I appreciate it. Well, I had, I, I'm not going to say anything because I hadn't announced yet. So yeah. I'll keep that to myself. But uh, it's for 17 and under young, uh, young men and women that uh, uh, likes to auctioneer, uh, no entry fee. Uh, we're asking them to bring two minimal uh, items to sell, and we'll probably have – one or two more items that we're going to let them sell that they don't have to. But I'm really excited, and it looks like right now we've got about five, I believe, that's entered. So uh, I'm excited about that. I'm more Man, excited. I am too. If you've, if, if you've never seen a oh, junior auctioneer contest, it yeah. is one of the coolest things. It is phenomenal. And these kids, I call them kids, but they're they're good. I they're mean, good. they're not just getting up. They practice. They've got a chance. Yes. They've got people they're working with. Um, I've coached a couple over the years, and they're they're good, man. They're, they're really good. Um, <laughs> some of them ought to be in the pro contest, <laughs> as good as they are. In all seriousness. So if well, you got it, if you got anyone, uh, get in touch with me, and uh, we'll get them. We'll get them taken care of and get them entered. And uh, uh, I'll throw a plug out. TriStar Bank which is over in Dixon, but they've got an office here. I reached out to Ted uh, Williams, the CEO, and um, didn't put any pressure on him, but I told Ted he needed to uh, sponsor. So Tri-State Bank is uh, sponsoring our junior championship this year, and I appreciate Great. Ted and uh, Tri-Star Bank for doing that. Yes, appreciate that a lot. Now, all the money that is raised from this contest goes to a particular uh, – function let's say tell us about that and who y'all have been able to help over the years okay originally uh when we put it in place back in 2012 <clears throat> the monies raised from the championship went to support our college scholarship program and also community projects that we were working on in 2010 or 2016 we voted that the auctioneer championship 100 percent would be uh, dedicated to fund our college uh, scholarship program uh, that we have uh, with some local schools here in columbia so since uh, 2016 it fully funds we have very minimal expense uh, thanks to some sponsors uh, and 100 percent 
of what is uh, made from the you know, championship goes to that college scholarship program. Uh, since its inception, we have awarded and we're just getting ready. Uh, in fact, the applications are coming in today. Uh, but to date, we have awarded over $70,000 in scholarships, and that includes a scholarship that we fund at Columbia State Community College in addition uh, to the ones that we have awarded here. Uh, 2000, I think it was 19, uh, we voted that if a student received the scholarship as a freshman, they could reapply the next year for an additional scholarship. And uh, Sydney Church was the first student to receive a scholarship all four years uh, toward her education at University of Tennessee Martin. I think Eddie told me this morning, we've got three that will be a reapplying for an additional scholarship. So we will total, um, uh, I think Eddie told me, $9,000 in scholarships this coming uh, year that will be awarded in May. So, right. Um, yeah, that's awesome. It's awesome. Yep. It is. And then we've also teamed up in 2019 with the American Legion. Uh, they help us with the uh, final championship round. They furnish all the uh, 50 items that will be sold in that. And we're we're uh, uh, helping the, the American Legion and the uh, veterans of Murray County and surrounding counties uh, also. So it's uh, it's a two-part. We feel very good about what we're doing. Well, I think it's important that contestants in this contest and in other contests know what that money raised goes to. In a lot of cases, it might go to a state association or to a, an auction association of some kind, which is phenomenal. It takes money to run this world, so that's great. But something like this, you know, you can go and get last place, and I, I tell people all the time, the worst thing that happens is you had fun and you raise money for a really, really sure. great cause. So it's it's more than just going for the buckle. Everybody wants to win, but, you know, you're, you're putting in work that day that might make a huge difference in somebody else's life. That's right. You know, like a scholarship. Yeah. And that's – you're going to work that day. An auction contest is going to work. You may not be working for a particular seller, so to speak, as you bring the items, but you are working for that organization that's putting on that that event. That's exactly right, Josh. And you know, when you when you say it's for the children, it's hard to have somebody turn you down. Sure. <laughs> so we, Absolutely. We're we're very pleased. We're very yep. pleased with what we're doing and uh I hope we can continue. Hope we continue continue from. I don't know how much more I've got, but uh, I've got a little bit left in the tank. So I'm going to be around for a few more years. Well, I don't think you have anything to worry about as far as it continuing. I think there's enough of us that heaven forbid should something happen to to anyone. I think there's enough of us in oh, this area I, that would make it keep I, going. I did. I did want to show you one thing. In fact, they came in today. If I can hold. Here's the case. I saw those. And uh, remember, Charlie Tisher is our resident knife man. And uh, we've got a mm. uh, two-bladed hen and rooster, and it's numbered. And uh, we've got them for sale now. And as you know, all the participating auctioneers and judges, uh, we don't charge them for one. So, uh, uh <laughs> You may be getting something. Who knows? Well, hey, that's a, it's a nice knife. They always are, and they're they're it's it's great too because this contest, y'all always make sure everybody leaves with something, and I appreciate that. Well, you know, it, it's really it can be really disheartening for someone to come, especially a long ways because this is an open contest, and they bring their items they spent money on, and they compete, and then they may not make the top ten or may have a bad run, and that gets you down, of course, and. It's nice to have, you know, y'all usually give a cap or a knife and, you know, you, you get to keep your chip that, that has your number on it. So that's, that's <laughs> nice too. Um, I'm running out of, I'm running out of chips. <laughs> oh no, you better get Farm Bureau to get you some more of those. <laughs> Eddie, let, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the other side of a contest as I call it, which is judging. So 
you were a judge for the Battle of the Bluegrass last year. Uh, I'm sure you've been a judge for multiple others as well. And uh, I want to get your take on the responsibilities of judging and the challenges of judging and what maybe you would look for as a judge in your champion. Our scorecard is, is pretty much um, goes along with the WLAC uh, scorecard. But I go back, Josh, one thing that when we put this in place, uh, the judges was a high priority on our list. And um, I'm old school. I don't believe that all the judges have to be champions or past champions. I, I think there are, are people out there that have been in the auction business that runs stockyards, that runs auctions, that that have as much knowledge of a good auctioneer as uh, a champion auctioneer. But I've always taken probably more out. knowledge than a champion yeah. auctioneer in a lot of I cases. Agree. I agree. Uh, the, the judges that we've had in the past uh, have had the auction background, the business. They've been past champions uh, of own, not only our contest, but uh, other uh, championships. So I, I take pr great pride. And when I look at the score sheets at the end of each championship, uh, I, I think they've got it right or they could have flipped them and nobody would have said anything, but I think they've always done a good job in the past 12 years. And um, they come, and the only thing that we, aff we afford them is if they need a room for the night, um, we'll get them a room. But other than that, uh, they come free of charge. Uh, I've had them tell me that they were honored that we even asked them to be a judge. So, uh, uh, I, and I wanted uh, our, our championship to have credibility uh, and, and never have any stains on it or anything. And uh, I'm very proud of our, our, our judges that we've had and uh, proud of the judges that we're going to have this year, which we will probably be letting everyone know who those judges are going to be here in three or four weeks or so uh, on that part of it. But as a judge, um, oh, gosh, um, I look for a, a good, positive introduction. Uh, get the attention uh, of your bidders. Uh, uh, have you a good opening statement uh, to get, what, get the auction started. And then um, have a, a good description. You don't need to be an expert on, on the item that you're selling, but you need to have some knowledge of what you're selling and give a good description of it and then and then go with it. Um, and you well know, I mean, I participated in the state. Uh, it makes no difference how many times you get up on an auction block. When you get up on a contest in front of your peers, I don't care who you are you're going to have sweaty palms when you get through. Now, you can get up and go out here and sell all day for James Gary, and the only sweat you're going to get is from the heat from the sun. And right. You're not going to be nervous. But up there, uh, try to be calm. Um, have a good opening introduction of yourself. Don't be too wordy. Uh, tell us who you are. Tell us where you're from. Uh, and then go to work and uh, be positive and uh, carry it through. Do a good closing. Have a good closing. Let all your bidders know that you're ready to close her down. And then um, uh, the chant part of it is what I'm looking for. Yeah. And well, I, chant, uh, I think one thing I see in some of the younger, and you teach it, uh, some of the younger auctioneers is that they want to be it. 9,000 RPMs the first time they take an auction block and clarity and the use. I think some of them try to throw too many uh, filler words into their chant. I think if you just develop you a good, basic, simple chant and clarity, because if your bidders can't, doesn't know what your bid amount is and what bid amount you're asking for, 
it's going to be a long day on the auction block for you. So clarity, uh, good, smooth, simple chant, uh, I think gets you a long way. Well, to that, to that end, Mule Day is, is unique, in my opinion, from the contest that I've been in because it is at Mule Days and anyone can walk in and get a bidder number, which this is true of all contests, I think. But at Mule Day, it's on the calendar, like it's on the catalog as an event for Mule Day. And you're going to have people show up who do not know about an auction contest, who may have never been to an auction before. <laughs> And you got to know your audience. Now, if you yeah. go to like the TAA, for example, everybody in there is a professional auctioneer, or let's right. say 90% right. of the people are professional auctioneers. You can kind of maybe have a little more fun with your chant uh, in that capacity. But Mule Day, I mean, and the stands are packed every year. I mean, there are people who come from all over just to come to that contest. So I think that's great advice, Eddie. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, yep. Josh. It's uh, just keep it simple. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's talk about competing for a minute. Uh, you compete in the state contest um, and do quite well, if I do say so myself. Oh, uh, that's, I support the AARP, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that's good. But uh, <laughs> why why do you compete? I mean, you don't have to. You're a member of the board. You know, you have an established career. Why compete? Well, if I go back. Uh, like I said, I had a, my career with Farm Bureau, and at that time, the TAA convention was in December, usually the first week in December, which was the same weekend as the Tennessee Farm Bureau convention. Right. Well, I had to make a choice. Did I go to the TAA and compete in the state? or I was told I needed to be at the Farm Bureau convention, and that was who was paying uh, me uh, on a regular basis. So for 39 and a half years or so, I was at the Farm Bureau convention the same time the uh, TAA was having their convention, and just never, uh, the only time I ever participated in a state contest before I started back after 2015, uh, we were having a big, large continuing education class. There was probably 40, 40 auctioneers in a class. And uh, I can't remember who the man, uh, who the auctioneer was that was on the commission, but we had a contest. And uh, I actually placed first in it, but it wasn't sanctioned. So I didn't get anything except a, a round of applause like that. So, uh, but after I, I retired and, and got involved in the TAA, I said, hey, I've never done it. Won't you try it and see how it is? And uh, I'm telling you, like I said, yeah, uh, Buddy Carter is a good example. Buddy has been an auctioneer for I don't know how many years and auctioned for IAA. And I got him to come up here from Athens uh, to compete. He competed a couple of years, and I never will forget. You know, I'm always I'm sitting up there beside the auctioneer, clerking the auction. And uh, when Buddy, <laughs> when Buddy got through with his round, he turned around to me and he shook his hand and he said, "I could I could have given him a towel because his hand was sweat for sweat." And he said, "I've never done anything like this in my life." <laughs> and so. Uh, uh, it, it's it's a little bit different, but yeah, I think everybody ought to do one. And when I get back to the Mule Day, that was one thing is that we wanted it. We we know these auctioneers uh, have got expenses, and that was one one thing we wanted to keep the entry fee at a very minimal amount. Which I think, if you look at hours compared to all these others, it's very very minimal uh we put a, a on the items you bring we put a minimum of twenty dollars and we've never had to worry about that you uh, you guys y'all bring y'all bring items and that's just never been a, a problem with us and but I, I want it to be affordable and i want the auctioneers to come yeah i think a lot of auctioneers appreciate that you know there are other contests and they have their merits and part of the reason that they have maybe a higher entry fee is because 
people who aren't serious about it, uh, if you're not serious about it, that might deter you from coming. So it's the, the, the category of auctioneers that are there might be higher. I, that's a bad way to look at it, but that, yeah. that may be the reason, but you know, it's mule day is very affordable. Y'all have always been good to work with auctioneers about getting us there uh, regardless of our circumstances. So I appreciate that and, and appreciate you. Cause I, I think it's, I think it's different when you've done something and then you're put in charge of something that you've done before rather than being in charge of something that you've never done before. So you've competed. You know what it's like to be behind the microphone in a contest. You know what it's like to work with judges. You know what it's like to um, bring your items and to do all that. And now being the facilitator of Mule Day, that comes in play. You know, I think that's one reason why Mule Day is so good is because you being the brainchild of, of or Mule Day being your brainchild is you've done it before. And and that's important to us as competitors. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, like I said, uh, it, it's, a, it's a total team effort from the Columbia Breakfast Rotary. And I couldn't do it without uh, uh, my two co-chairmans, Daryl Alshire and uh, Eddie Allred, uh, they take uh, a good part of it off. And then we've got members like Charlie Tisher who does our knives. So everybody is, is, is putting in and uh, uh, we've got sort of a basic core group that knows what they're going to do at every championship. And it runs pretty smooth. It runs yes, pretty smooth. Well, Eddie, we're uh, getting close to being out of time for this episode, but I always end our podcast with some rapid fire questions. And okay. uh, these are just like, one or two word or one or two sentence questions. If you have a story you want to tell for one, go right for it. I'm not, I don't okay. care. These are just right. fun we'll, questions. We'll, we'll, see. we'll see how it does. Yeah. All right. Um, what's the weirdest item you've ever sold? Probably Josh, right off the top of my head, two gray plots. <laughs> okay. At an estate uh, auction. Uh, they said, can you sell them? I said, well, have you got title to them? They said, yes, they, they're bought and paid for and said, uh, we want them in the estate auction, so we sold two gray plots. I've never yes. thought about this, but is that does that fall under personal property or real estate? <laughs> I don't. I, I, I don't, don't know. We didn't have to record anything at the real estate <laughs> office. <laughs> uh, um, out of all the items that you've sold, or uh, and all the sales that you've had, is there one that sticks out as your favorite? Let's say you're meeting a stranger. And you just they you start talking about the auction business, and you just say, "Hey, we did this one time, and it was it was so much fun." That's hit me. Tell me that again now. Ask me is that. The, is there a favorite item that you've sold that you enjoy talking about the most? Mm. Or maybe a favorite auction that you've done that you enjoy yeah. talking about? Probably Mister Curry's auction uh he's probably got one of the largest uh collections of any type of old uh hammers old tools like that and we were fortunate uh todd his son after mr herschel passed away but we went out and did uh two auctions for todd and uh, sold a lot of his collection, and um, it, it was, uh, if you knew Mr. Herschel, you knew what he had, and that was a fun auction, and I uh, was honored that Todd got us to come out and uh, do it. Uh, a lot of neat items, old items, uh, each one of them sort of had a story behind it that Todd relayed to us. And that was uh, Mr. Herschel probably collected for fifty plus years, and that was that was that was neat. Two neat auctions that we did. Cool. Uh, what's your go-to filler word? Oh, uh, dollar down, da done, da done, dollar down, dollar down is probably okay. Um, do you like online or live auctions better? Ah, uh, old school. Uh, I'm live. Come I on. do the online, and I tell Lee every time I do one, this is my last one. Uh, <laughs> old school. I'm live. Yeah. Uh, what, in your opinion, makes contests valuable? 
I think you're building your uh, a reputation that will help you down the road. If 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 you're wanting to be a professional auctioneer, uh, say in the cattle market, the automobile market, I, I think you can add uh, the championships to your resume and will probably help you. And uh, you're getting experience. Um, um, you're going to learn better public speaking from the contest that you enter. Uh, you're going to ha have a better demeanor of interacting with people. So uh, I think contests can help you in those those senses. Sure. Eddie, who, uh, who are some auctioneers that you love to listen to? Matt Lowry. Uh, Ralph Wade, you got a good chance. Thank you. Right, you. Chuck Bradley, Jacob, Massey, but uh, I really like Matt Lowry. And no one uh, can do it quite like he can. He's just, I don't know, he's just really smooth. And, and if you pull up a YouTube on Matt, uh, there's one where he does a basic auction chant. And if you look at it, uh, when we talk about being simple, uh, if, if you just follow that basic chant, one dollar down, one bidder, one dollar bidder, two dollar bidder, and then add to that, he does a good job on that. But I, I just, I like to listen uh, to Matt. And Ralph Wade, I mean, he's just in a, he's just in another category as far as yeah. i'm concerned yeah but, well, uh, matt lowry's basic chant is the one that i teach at auction school i don't okay. want to plagiarize but i take his basic chant and tell them that it's his basic chant and show them the video and I'm like this is what we're going to use because i think it is so simple it and is. it's so easy to build rhythm off of yes it is yeah. um well if anybody if any of our listeners knows matt lowry charlie cummins ralph wade i'd love to have them on the podcast so shoot me a message and get <laughs> Let uh, hook me up, man. Uh, um, it, it would be neat. Yeah. All right, Eddie. Um, what's one piece of advice you would give a new auctioneer? When you're developing your chant, instead of thinking speed and filler words first, think clarity. Have a clarity chant. Um, if you're not humble, be humble. And um, I'll tell one quick story. We're in a profession to help people. Josh, you know that. And um, I had one person ask me what was the worst thing about the auction profession and what you do. And uh, I had to think a minute, but it came to me. The worst part of our job is that we can take a couple that's been married 65 years have an estate auction and do away with their lifetime in four hours. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, we've helped the family get through a trying experience of lo lo losing a loved one and help them through that. So, uh, but I'd say going back, uh, if you're going to do that chant, uh, think about clarity, sure. uh, you chant and uh, have some humbleness about you and be willing to uh, help and be willing to admit a mistake. Uh, we're not perfect. And uh, if you've said something wrong or not got it right, um, fess up to it and say it's my mistake and let's move on and uh, we'll correct it. Sure. Absolutely. Love that. Uh, Eddie, out of all of the 12 champions, who's your favorite? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh Huh, do what, Lee? Hey, and Lee said, "Don't answer that." <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to trip you up. Oh, oh I'd say to he, he, Oh, I don't know. His first name probably starts somewhere between A and Z. That's right. Yeah, y'all yeah, need to it down for us. I, listen, I'd take any one of you twelve to sell for me tomorrow or today. Uh, y'all are class acts, and. Uh, uh, we're very proud uh, of our champions. We sort of think we're the home of champions, the Tennessee Livestock Producer Sale Barn, which is now United Producers, is the home to the MDAC. 
and we don't see we've had a couple of folks that's wanted us to change it uh, but I sort of put a survey out to all the auctioneers and it came back 100 percent please don't move it uh, mm -hmm. keep it where it's at so that's where we're going to be yeah uh, now unless they run us out well I hope they don't because that's a, I that's don't a good facility it's yeah it's a, and it's really good because it's made for an auction so that that it helps is. too it yeah. does all right, Eddie, one last thing I want you to do for me, and then I'll let you go. Why don't you sell something for us? Let's hear that chant. You want to sell something? We'll do an introduction, and then we'll sort of go into it and uh, see if we can uh, see if we can do something here. Able to write, sir, to get the swing. Get aboard. It's auction time. Dead or done. Be gone. And tell me, what are you going to do? Hey, $100. One, two, two. Hey, $200. One, two, two. Hey, $300. 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 Hey, $300. All in and all down. But it got $200. Sold them $100. Put it on number 88. Craig them and send them to the dock, boys. Love it. I love it. This is one thing we didn't talk about. We're going to have to have you on later uh, in another episode to talk about the change in style of auction chant from what you have and, and what your generation has to what I'm hearing a lot now. Yeah. That'd be an interesting conversation to have. But man, that was awesome. I think this has been an awesome episode. Thank you so much for being on and thank you for all the hard work that you do with the Mule Day Auction Contest, with the Rotary Club, and just for auctioneers everywhere. We really appreciate you, and I hope you know that. Well, Josh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate what you're doing with your podcast to promote the professional auctioneer. I appreciate you as a champion of the Mule Day Auctioneer, and we'll probably see you April Friday, April the 5th, at the United Producer Sale Barn for the 13th Annual Mule Day Auctioneer Championship. Thank you. Yep, thank you. <laughs> You've been listening to the Better Bid Calling Podcast. If you would like to sponsor an episode, please contact us at betterbidcalling at gmail.com.